So population boom or bust. What every country needs is zero population growth, really. High population growth rate that leads to the boom, the rapid growth on the left, and then the negative growth on the on the right are both no good for any nation. What we really need is to slow population growth and then have zero population growth because rapid population growth would hurt productivity and negative population growth will also hurt uh, it leads to population decline that does not support sustainable socioeconomic development. And we all know the total fertility rate as the, the average number uh, of children women would have and the replacement fertility is really where everybody is, has to go to. B is the boom or the bust. How do we get to the replacement level uh, fertility? Because that is where you have population and sustainable development merging. Not just population, the numbers, the head count without quality or the quality with reduced head count. There should be a balance between the head count and the quality. And that is why I am very excited with the theme population boom or bust. The issue is economic, socioeconomic development and where nations should stand. Then the aim of population management, it's, it's really harmonization between individual and societal health with livelihood and cohesion. Basically that is it. And it always starts, there's a precondition to it. A healthy start is a precondition to minimizing cost, not just economic cost, but health cost, social cost, psychological cost, whilst optimizing health and productivity. The main outcome of effective population management is optimization of health and productivity to maximize individual and total utility from generation to generation, not just one generation and then the other generation suffers, but from generation to generation. So basically that is uh, the aim of effective population management. And sustainable development in my mind has three bottom line, individual well-being, societal well-being, environmental sustainability, climate change, all in harmony. So how do we get individual well-being within societal well-being and then the whole environment supporting us? That is really where sustainable development is. The triple bottom line is individual, societal, and environment. Because society is made up of individuals and the environment that sustains us should also not be compromised. The well-being of individuals from population viewpoint actually ensures that women have children when they are healthiest for optimal outcome. It's just like any other, uh, any, any other program. You sow the best seed for the best yield. That is how it is. So women have children when they are healthiest for optimal outcome. And it's more efficient and less cost effective. I mean, more cost effective. And so when countries like mine do not, I mean, there's a lack of attention to reproductive health and then there are issues, it, 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 it translates into, uh, say, the high risk of morbidity and mortality for women. And then there are high economic costs to individuals and families. And so economists, I know there are a lot of economists, so I try to bring in some economic terms uh, to fit in somehow. You know? So the high population growth, the baby boom, what is the op op opportunity cost to it? What is the marginal gain to, I mean, high population growth rate when we are not paying attention to reproductive health and family planning? And there are high omit needs for family planning. There are so many unplanned pregnancies, teenage pregnancies and child marriages. It all increases the population, but then it increases it in headcount, but not in quality. So the well-being of individuals and society and the environment that sustains it should really be at the back of the population uh, discourse. We all know that we can do much about the past. And so we focus on the present and the future to improve lives and livelihoods and maximize our utility. And like uh, weather experts, economic experts, and all experts warn us about the future problems or how to have the minimum impact if there's a problem. That is why when there's a hurricane, they will tell us to move out because of the impact. So there's a warning. 
and population experts also have the same mandate to advise that some bets affect our lives and livelihoods negatively because it would increase our dependency ratio, reduce our life expectancy, and utilities will also be compromised. So all experts are supposed to advise for current and future because we cannot do much about the past. Basically, that is where the population experts also fit into any other, like the economist will tell us that some investments are not good, they will not yield good returns, so would population experts advise that too early, too late, too close, too many, and too few bets negatively affects lives and livelihoods. Not in the same magnitude, but it definitely affects life and livelihoods. In the developing world, we have too many, too late, too close bets affecting our lives and livelihoods. And then in the developed world, we have too few bets affecting our lives and livelihoods. And so the harmony and the balance is really where we should all strive to be. Now we come to where I sit, the current situation in Sub-Saharan Africa and the indicators that are making it difficult for us to develop. The young age, 40% under 15 years. The global is 26%, Asia 24. The dependency ratio, 85, which means that there are so few people taking care of so many children. And we all know that children are absolute consumers. And so that is a challenge. We have 80% dependency ratio below uh, uh, in children, and then just 5% above uh, 65 years compared to Asia, which means that the number of people supporting, 1.2 people supporting uh, per person in the developed world, and you have about 2.8, which means even if with the same GDP per capita, some are going to be better off than others because you have two people and then somewhere else you have less than two people supporting. Then the median age in Sub-Saharan Africa is 18. Global is 30, Asia is 31. And this is where we have a lot of uh, criminologists talking about the linkage between median age and crime. There's a link between median age and crime. There's a link between median age and restlessness. So when there are so many young people, very active and unemployed and not meeting their social uh, needs, they can tend to into, into crime. Just the age and the numbers can uh, set the condition for that. Ultimately, affecting the human development index. Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest human development index. It is the fastest growing population because we are not taking into consideration the science of effective population management in our programming. We have the global index of 0 0.73 and Sub-Saharan Africa 0 0.54. And life expectancy compared to global also markedly reduced because all these indicators affect the quality of life and the provisions of services. So the current situation in terms of health, education, employment, security, and others is what I will try and go through with you. Health indicators. We all know health is a prerequisite to education and just also a prerequisite to quality employment because when you are not healthy, it's difficult to learn. And if you do not learn, then it's difficult to get a, a good job in the 21st century where knowledge is the currency. Then, so we have high maternal uh, mortality because we have high teenage pregnancy, high unmet need for family planning, high child marriage, which also translates into high maternal mortality figures. And you have four out of 10 countries in the world with the highest under five mortality rate located in West Africa, because you also have the highest uh, uh, child marriages and high teenage uh, pregnancies also in those countries. And anemia is also there. We have a number of physicians, the number, the, the, the patient doctor ratio so high and so quality of care is compromised. Life expectancy in Sierra Leone is less than 60 years. And then, so all those indicators affect health. You know, population, the healthy start, if you have a healthy start, it means you can have a, a healthy childhood, a healthy adolescent, and then a healthy adult. And then with a negative start with teenage pregnancy and child marriage, then you can have some of these indicators which translate into other areas because it's a continuum. The people who are born are sick, 
when they are not healthy, that same cohort gets into education and they cannot learn, and that same cohort moves out and unemployment becomes an issue in sub-Saharan Africa. And so education. In the 21st century, uh, education is really the way to go. And uh, relevant education, of course, not just any type of education, but relevant education. And then the number of years our children are spending in school is lower. Then we have the pupil teacher ratio, which is so high with like the previous slides talks about malnutrition. And we all know what malnutrition does to children. Stunted, you cannot learn. And then we have a, a high a teacher people ratio compromising it further. So translating into about 20% of children in primary, uh, in primary school out of school, which is not good in the 21st century where we're thinking about uh, where knowledge is the currency. So you also have adult literacy, which is very low because women who spend time in, in childcare cannot spend that same time in education. It's 24 hours everywhere. And so if you spend so much time care in, in, in having so many babies, you lose that time to education. So the opportunity costs. And because there are so many other, other competing demands, there's no public expenditure allocated to education. So it's like the chicken and the hen, which one comes first? And where should we break it? We cannot break it at one end. We have to break it simultaneously at two ends. Then we get onto the gender inequality index. The gender inequality index, which takes into consideration a maternal mortality ratios, it takes into consideration education of women, how the women participate in, a, in civic a, a duties and then also in economic duties. And West, West Africa is at the bottom of the human development index because the women are spending time in, 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 in other places and so they do not have that same time to spend somewhere else. So there's higher levels of inequality between men and women in terms of healthcare education and living standards. And we all know that inequality hurts everyone, just like the world has on equal fertility rates and it's hurting every, every, all of us. So inequality between men and women also hurts uh, all. Women in parliament, of course, if they are not educated, if they are not healthy, not educated, it's difficult to get into parliament. And so you get very few women in parliament and very few men in decision-making positions and it's difficult for, for the women's voice to be heard because they are not up there to make the case for other women. Then employment. So we move from health, education, employment. That is how it, it, it moves on. When you are not very healthy, you cannot learn, you cannot get good employment, you get into vulnerable employment. So vulnerable employment levels are linked with low levels of education, of labor force, and low tax payment. So the continuum, low level of education, low tax payment, and then low uh, level of development nationally. And many workers without minimum qualification required. If you, if you remember the previous two slides, education, 20% of our children are falling out. And so when they become adult, adolescents and adults, they enter the workforce with minimal qualification. You have about 88% of workers in Guinea who are, who, that is the highest rate of vulnerable employment in the sub-region. And they fail to complete primary education compared to 4.4 in Cape Verde who are doing a better with the, with the vulnerable employment rates. And so in the 21st century, if you have so many people who fail to complete primary education, what future do they have in an era where COVID is even automating other things, where the future of jobs is, is really moving away from uh, yes, using the, the, the human creativity and moving away uh, from automation and letting computers and other things do automation for us. So the implications are numerous and there are security implications. It does not therefore surprise so many, some of us why um, there's a lot of uh, unrest in the Sub-Saharan Africa, the Sahel regions, because the low median age, the high school dropout, high unemployment, High dependency ratio means that people will not have their needs met. And if you do not have your needs met, you have to make them, you have to meet them somehow. So we have the terrorist attacks, insecurities in the Sahel, and uh, communal violence, the terrorists, and all those things, jeopardizing the peace and security. And this ultimately threatens socioeconomic development. 
And so population boom really hurts everybody, not just where the boom is, but I mean, internationally, because if there's no security in South Saharan Africa, it is difficult to enjoy security somewhere else. Just like the COVID came from China and everybody else is better. So the enablers to sustainable development and the enablers of sustainable development is quality relevant education. It's not negotiable and healthy individuals, because if you're not healthy, you cannot avail yourself to quality relevant education and equity, equity in all its forms, equity in reproductive health rights and services for women, so that in addition to reproduction or for sustainable uh, population growth, they would have time to educate themselves and contribute their quota, including taxes for national development. We also have sufficient numbers of working age people to dependents. That is critical. And optimal population growth rate. It is not the baby boom or the baby bust, but optimal population growth rate, which is at least or at most 1% population growth rate, which means that the population is going to double every 70 years. Then the barriers to sustainable development are widespread ill health, because ill health would jeopardize quality education diseases, hunger, malnutrition, unemployment, and suboptimal population growth rate. And all these are hinges on suboptimal population growth rate. Now I'm just talking about the baby boom, not the baby bus. They have other issues, but these are real barriers to sustainable development. The main challenges we have is opposition to the science of effective population management. You know, there are so many uh, issues about it, probably also rightly so, but there's so much opposition to the science of effective population management. The science is, or what people think, it's the rich wants to use that to control the poor. And so it's a resistance even before people avail themselves to the knowledge and the wisdom of effective population management, which needs to be addressed. And also there's a, a information entirely based on opinion and outmoded culture. Opinion and outmoded culture, religion that supports large families, but religion should support quality life, irrespective of whether the family is large or small. Quality life on a sustainable basis. The culture that supports Male, male, male children, because the male tends to take care of the families. But small families can also, I mean, they will even be more supportive. So the culture and the opinion outmoded has not, we have not really confronted it because of so many other uh, groundless intelligence information that governments, at times even governments, use as if. Uh, the uh, co population management is a controlling um, a mechanism to get uh, some tribes extinct and things like that. But so that really needs to be addressed. In my mind, these are the main challenges, opposition to the science of effective population management. Population management should not just be looking at the, the acceptor rates, for instance, family planning acceptor rates. No, that should not be the case. It should be how family planning supports sustainable development. So the discussion and the conversation should, should, should change. It should be, for instance, how immunization, polyimmunization supports sustainable development, how nutrition supports sustainable development, how family planning or population management supports sustainable development, not the acceptor rate or reduce your fertility, how family planning enhances your well-being and societal well-being while supporting the environment that sustains us. So some of the recommendations I'm putting across is open and science-based attitude. We should shape incentives, norms, and regulations to navigate our future based on open and science-based attitude with the bottom line of quality life for all, quality life for individuals and quality life for all. We can also do that through incentives and regulations to prevent or promote people based on their values. I know that in the 1970s, Sub-Saharan Africa was sufficient in food supply, and that's a fact. So what is happening? Why aren't we now self-sufficient in food supply? And you can link it to the population. We're growing faster than we are 
uh, we are using technology. So we need to have it at the same at the same end. How do we slow the population growth rate down so that technology can serve us? So preventing or promoting specific actions in food sufficiency, education, family planning, and basic healthcare together as a collective is critical. A lot of the things we're doing now, we're focusing on food sufficiency, focusing on education, focusing on basic healthcare, but not focusing on family planning as we should. By the time we get to food sufficiency, education, and basic healthcare, without focusing on family planning, the the, the, the poverty will, will, a gap will widen between the rich and the poor. It has to be a collective of all these things together. Recommendations, it's the norms, incentives, and regulations should specify the multiple agents. It is critical that we see population management as a multiple agent program, where government, the financial market, the political, civil, and societal spheres national and international are all coming together to support a, an incentive program, a passive incentive program that has so much education, so much services that uh, depends on people's volu voluntary, voluntary choices, but from an informed position. Not voluntary choices in ignorance, but voluntary choices from an informed position to help the agenda. So the way forward is open and science-based dialogue. And knowing that population dynamic and development are intertwined, you cannot have population development without focusing on population dynamics. And the policy choices are critical. And leadership should be bold. We have, should have bold leadership and the effective communication with the public and service provision to make sure that we steer where we want to go in the right direction. We can go anywhere, but if we are targeted, we have to be targeted. We have to be intentional, not cohesive, no. Cohesion does not work, but with knowledge and, and, uh, and the right services to move forward the agenda. So in conclusion, effective population management entails certain standards, certain standards for quality of life of people, incentives, regulations, and use of norms, values, and encouraging practices, promoting information and its use in concert to improve human well-being through linear programming with the objective of minimizing costs whilst maintaining optimal health. And this can only be attained if we ensure that the outcome of any pregnancy is a healthy woman and a healthy baby. And it will happen that way, when the woman is empowered to have the baby when she is healthiest. So creating harmony between reproduction and production from one generation to the next, focusing on improving individual and collective well-being and looking at the environment that sustains us is really the focus of effective population management and should stay the focus of effective population management. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm.